Okay, everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining. Welcome to the Leading Change uh, webinar on behalf of the Institute of, of Leadership and Management uh, to celebrate or commemorate their International Leadership Leadership Week. There's all sorts of uh, webinars and workshops and seminars going on uh, around the country and uh, even around the world uh, to celebrate their particular Leadership Week. I'm Campbell McPherson. Today is going to be all about change, and I'll introduce myself in greater detail and tell you all about myself in, in a little while. Uh, but today is about leading change, and leading change is the most important leadership skill of them all. What I do is I specialise in, in change, and in particularly in change leadership, because not only is it the most important leadership skill of them all, but it's the most important um, part or component of successful change and successful change is really difficult as we all know uh, to come about. So what we're going to go through today are these things. I'm going to go through a few of the key themes that we'll repeat and underline throughout the next 40 minutes or so. So be 40 minutes of me talking and by all means put any questions as you go through in the chat and uh, the wonderful Amy will, will draw my attention to them if I if I miss out on your question. I'll then introduce myself and who the Dickens am I, uh, for those of you who don't know me. Then I'd like to hear from you about what you've learned about change in these last three years. So give, give some thought to that and get ready to put it into the chat. I'll then talk to you about the five key truths I've learned about change over the last 25 years. Then we get stuck into the essential ingredients of successful change which will also include how we react to change because all change is personal and emotional and it's all about leadership. And so we'll finish with the fact that change is all about leadership and it's all about influence. So what does what does extraordinary change leadership actually look like? And we'll cover that as well. And the end uh, at about 22, probably quarter two, uh, we'll go through some Q&A and I want you to share your nuggets. And what I mean by that is to take a piece of paper and right on the top of it, put the word nuggets. Because in any meeting, in any workshop, um, if you just take away one or two key nuggets of insight that you can actually put into practice straight away, then it's been a really good use of your time. In fact, it's a good test of any meeting or workshop you go on. Have you taken any nuggets away with you? Hopefully there'll be a whole page after today and not just from me, but also from, from the chat and the comments uh, from all of you. As, you, as we go through today. And feel free to comment on anything as you go through. Oh, there's a good one, Richard, you've kicked off. What's the key difference between change and innovation? I, I believe that innovation is step change. Uh, so there's two types of change. One is, is continuous improvement, and the other, I would say, is innovation. So in my mind, I put innovation in the step change. It's like evolution and revolution. That's, that's how I uh, define them. In fact, in the Leading with Influence program, I've just been uh, running with a major uh, fund manager, major organization. That's how we looked at continuous improvement and step change, and we need both. Anyway, yes, a recording of this webinar will be available um, afterwards. I will be uh, putting it on uh, LinkedIn, and you can also go to the videos uh, page of my site where you will find it. Um, if not later this afternoon, certainly tomorrow morning. <laughs> Excuse me. So let's crack on. Here's some of the key themes that I want to talk through today or that you'll hear today and I want your opinion on. Firstly, is that successful change is all about leadership. Of the three books that I've, that I've written, you can see over my shoulder and on the first page, the one that won the business book of the year was called The Change Catalyst. And when I was writing that, I wasn't I, it wasn't until I finished writing it that I worked out it was a book about leadership because successful change is all about leadership. 88% of change initiatives fail. The same percentage of business strategies, the same percentage of mergers and acquisitions, they all don't deliver what they set out to achieve. And it's not because of poor change management. It's because of inadequate change leadership. And we'll talk about the difference uh, in that. Uh, as we go through today. So successful change is all about leadership and we are all leaders. No matter where we sit in an organization, we are a leader and therefore a leader of change. And one of the big reasons for this is that leadership is not about hierarchy, it's about influence. So therefore we can all influence others to help them to do 
what we need to be done and also to help them do what they need to be done as well. Leadership is all about influence and we're all leaders. But leadership is all, so change is all about leadership, but leadership is all about change because if we're not leading change, what are we really doing? We're managing the status quo and frankly, we're just watching it unravel. That's not leadership. Leadership is all about change, but so is life. So as we will talk about at the end, and it's really what the second book was about, The Power to Change, is that the ability to accept change, to embrace change, and to make it work for you is the key life skill of them all. It's about acceptance, and it's about embracing change. And as leaders of change, which we all are on this course, or on this call, sorry, as leaders of change, if our people if the people we work for, if the people we work with and the people that, that work for us aren't able to embrace change, then nothing is going to happen. So there's some of the key things. Let me now talk about who I am and introduce myself. This is the website. Please jot, jot it down, changeandstrategy.com. This is, this is my website. And there's so many bits and pieces, including a video of this uh, um, within, a, within a day or so that will be available from the website. I help leaders worldwide to build extraordinary leadership teams, and I also help them to create highly successful leaders of change. And as I like to say, starting with ourselves. Um, here are some of the programs and workshops that, that we run. Uh, it's about extraordinary leadership teams. It's about extraordinary leadership. Uh, the, 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 the really hot one at the moment is Leading with Influence, which is a program uh, that we're running in several organizations. And of course, the Leading Change, Delivering Change, and embracing change workshops and webinars that, that I've been running for many, many years for Henley Business School and for other organizations in, around the world. And some of the organizations uh, of my experience um, are here that I have had experience in. Um, as a, uh, those of you who know me will know my careers uh, ended up, um, and my careers have been wide and varied. I've been an HR director, uh, I've been a marketing director, I've been a, a, an e-commerce director, I've been strategy director of Zurich uh, for the Emerging Markets uh, Division. And my career's actually started way back when I uh, accidentally joined the Royal Australian Air Force straight from school. And I still have the, the dubious honour of being the worst pilot ever to make it through to jets in the Royal Australian Air Force. And in fact, my, my flying was so bad uh, that landing was always a problem. And the reason for that is that I had to memorize the eye chart to keep flying. So uh, back in the 1980s, all you needed to know was C-L-E-D-H-B-T-V-O, and they let you take a jet up solo. Madness. Anyway, I finished that fast and ended up with a vast uh, array of careers and all sorts of different disciplines. And change was the one thing that was common. It was the one common denominator. And in fact, 25 years ago, when I was at Anderson Consulting, that's when I found first discovered that change was a discipline and not just something that happened. I also also discovered that unlike at Anderson Consulting back in those days, change is not about systems, change is not about processes, change is entirely about people. And as leaders of change, it's about helping people to want to change. So what I'd love to know from you and put it in the, in, in the chat while I, I talk to you about what some of the other delegates of other workshops have said, what have you learned about change these last three years? I mean, goodness me, have we been through a lot of change and it's not slowing up any day soon with the virus, with Ukraine, with the inflation. What have you learned about your ability to lead change, your ability to cope with change and your ability to embrace change and help others to embrace change over the last three years? And as you're typing those into the chats, because it will be really interesting a collection that I'll share with you afterwards. Let me share with you a few of the things that other delegates have actually said in answer to that question. And I think the first two are fantastic. On, on the first time we did this, this, this webinar, which is probably about four years ago now, uh, one, one delegate said, you know what I've learned, Campbell, is that not all change is bad. And I thought, OK, that's good. And the next one said, that's funny, because what I've learned is that not all change is good. And they're both right. I almost thought, there we go. There's, there's the webinar. But even good change is only net good. There are consequences to everything. No change is perfect. And you know when you implement a, a new organization design and everyone focuses on, on the negatives of the structure? because no structure is perfect. What if we took a step back and said, 
No structure is perfect and said that up front and said, let's focus on the 80% of the change that is good and let's work out together how to mitigate the 20% of the change that was actually taking this back. So even good change is net good. I think what we've also found is that we can change if we had the motivation to do so. So think back to 2020. It seems like such a long time ago now, doesn't it? Think back to 2020. We suddenly, every single one of us started to work from home instantly within about a week or so if we would have set out to do a change project to do that we'd still be in the project initiation phase it simply wouldn't have happened inside of 18 months and it happened inside a week so we can change if we want to and if we need to and change means opportunity karen i love that that's really good uh, adaptation is fun, difficult, but this comes with change. That is so good. Learn resilience, be focused. Resilience is critical, and we will touch on that a little bit later. We can change quicker than we thought, but we can change when, only if we want to, if we're all, if we really have the motivation to change. Sometimes we change if we have to as well, and we'll talk about that a little later. Successful change requires constant uh, vigilance, and some people cope with change better than others. And actually, we cope with change better. It's in certain circumstances, uh, certain circumstances than we do in other circumstances. And so we have to be aware of that, be aware that others may not uh, be able to change as quickly as we are in this circumstance. And sometimes we will actually be the laggard as well. And building resilience, as you said, is key. Communication is critical. I agree. Change is done in steps and small steps. There's some fantastic, uh, um, there's some fantastic comments coming through the chat. In summary of all of that, here are the five key truths I've learned about change in the 25 years since I was at Anderson Consulting. They might they may look like blinding glimpses of the obvious when you first look at them, but they're not. Let's have a look at them. Number one is that change is inevitable. A bit of a BGO. No, it isn't. Because once you actually appreciate or accept the inevitability of change, that it's not a project, that it doesn't have a start date or an end date, that it's continuous, then you can actually start to accept it and embrace it and work out how looking for the positives of what I can do with that change. How can I, how I can make that change work for me, for my people and for the organization, because all change is personal. Oh, I love that, Paul. Everything is about change. I completely agree with that one, as someone else did too, with a laughy face. Anyway, with a laughy major, all change is personal because we all erect our own personal barriers to change. Do you just think about it? You have a default personal barrier to change. So do I. And they, they will happen instantly. Some of our barriers will 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 we were able to um, uh, get over it or disregard or crumble in about 30 seconds and others will take a lifetime it depends on where you are in the change curve as we will talk about possibly one of the biggest biggest things that i've learned in the, uh, writing these books is that all change is emotional every single change is emotional in fact logic is only 20 percent of the case for change. If we are logically agreeing with the, 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 the case for the change and the need for change, we're only 20% there. If we're to engage in the change properly, if we were to help people engage in the change properly, then the 80% of us to really engage with the change is all emotional. And if you think about that, you know that to be true. All change is emotional. So as change leaders, we have to look to, to what are the emotional barriers that our people are going through, but also how we can excite them and get them on board emotionally, appealing to their ego, their status, um, their, even their, their, their insecurity and understanding where they are emotionally, because that's what we have to uh, deal with or, or embrace so that they can embrace change as well. But the fifth one is so true. We only change if we want to. <clears throat> and that and that is that is so ridiculously true we only change we want to we humans don't change because we're told to we only change if we want to so as leaders and we're all leaders of change here leadership is about helping people to want to change right paul you win 215 in new zealand that's it sorry bala you've been trumped by paul 215 a.m welcome good morning so leadership is about helping people to want to change and i think that is critical and it's some to me that is the summary of leadership. 
but also we can be our own leaders. We can be our own leaders of change. But change is tough. As I said before, 88% of change initiatives actually fail, which as soon as I saw that from Bain & Co back in, what was it, 2014, no, 2016, I knew I had the hook for the first book because the first 10 chapters are why change fails and the second 10 chapters are, well, what are we going to do about it? So why do change fails? And you all know, Quite a few of these. It changes because of lack of direction of purchase. It fails because of the communication, as you said, is, is not up. It fails because of ego and politics from complacency. But mostly it fails because we humans don't like change. So I would have, and, and, and the, the whole reason really comes down to leadership because leading change is tough. Even Machiavelli said that it's one of the most difficult things you can possibly do as a leader is to lead successful change. But that's what we are all able to do because we're going to go through now the essential ingredients of successful change. So get your nugget pages ready and let's let's go through some of them. Number one, top of the pops here, of the essential ingredients of sustainable change is clarity. And it's clarity of not only what we're trying to achieve, but also why. So we need the what, we need the numbers and the narrative. Those of you in financial services, numbers are easy. We're going to double the, the size of the business. We're going to triple profits. We're going to increase AUM by 25%. All that's great and it's sort of easy, but also the narrative. What sort of business? What sort of department? What sort of team? What sort of outcome are we actually trying to achieve? And just as importantly, because we humans don't change unless we want to, we need to know why. So clarity of what? Clarity of strategy. And you can download my overview of uh, the essential guide to strategy from the website. And it starts with what are we trying to achieve and why do we exist? We also need clarity of magic. What is the magic of the current state that we don't want to throw away? We don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater. So what is the magic of the way we currently work that we want to retain? What are those sacred cows? What are those things that we don't question? And what are the elephants in the room? Those questions we dare not answer. We need all of that clarified, bring them out the table. That's the clarity of the what. And that means we need to focus on outcomes. Do you know what? Um, process is really important. Process is really important, but it's a roadmap. First, we need to know what is the outcome we need to achieve because a, a, road, a roadmap without a destination is simply a, a map to nowhere. And then we need clarity of why. So why do we need to change? There's a right reason and a real reason for this. Now, the right reason will be logical. We, we're, we're, going to, uh, we're, we're going to be part of this business that's going to double the size of the business or we're going to take 10% out of the cost of the business, whatever the logical reason is. And that's a logical reason that I need to change the 20% of my head. The 80% of my heart wants to know the real reason, which is really... What's in it for me, in a sense? What is the emotional reason why I need to change? And as leaders of change, we have to appeal to every single one of our people's emotions. And as a corporate leader, we need to understand the emotions and the drivers of our people so that we can appeal to those emotions. They want to know why they need to change. <clears throat> number two on the list is ensuring implications are fully understood. This might be number three. I think we've done two already. Anyway, ensuring implications are fully uh, understood. I did a piece of work with a major uh, financial services platform a little while ago, and the CEO stood up and gave the version of the strategy. And he literally said, we're going to double the size of the business, triple the profit. Uh, and and uh, isn't that going to be fabulous jobs for all? Yeah, what do I do? That's good, Paul. I agree with that entirely. Um, and, 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 and in fact, my strategy and the strategic core of even talk about why do we exist? Um, what is it that we do that's differently? And so what are the benefits to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to the, all of the stakeholders? Anyway, back to this. Ensure implications are fully understood. So the CEO stood up and gave his version of the strategy and said, this is what we're trying to achieve. Then I stood up and I had behind me a, a board that said, a slide that simply said, what could possibly go wrong? And everyone tittered. And I said, seriously, as the CEO was talking about the strategy, all that's going through your head are all the reasons why 
it's going to be difficult. All the things that could go wrong, all the obstacles that he hasn't thought about. So let's get all of them out on the table. And this is normal. We need to do this in every change initiative, in every business strategy we try and implement. So we got all of the negatives and the obstacles and the fears and the challenges out on the table. Um, it was a, Everyone was a bit nervous to start with. And then it was a bit of a flurry. It was like a flood. Then we prioritized them, and then we, we, we uh, of all 100 managers, they separated into tables of 10, and we worked on how are we going to overcome them. So literally by the end of the day, we, not, we had all of the key objectives out the, of objections out on the table, and we had ways that they were actually going to work to overcome them. So not only everyone was on board with the change, with the strategy, but it was their change in strategy because they saw how it could actually be how they we're actually going to implement it. <clears throat> and as I said before, even good change is net good. So don't let the pursuit of perfection get in the way of good. If it's 80% good, let's celebrate the 80% and then work to maybe mop up some of the 20%. But let's focus on the big part of the pie. And we don't do that. We don't do that enough. And 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 even if we even if your people aren't actually saying that they're thinking the 20% negatives will, will be much larger in their head uh, than, um, than it should be. So get all of those negatives out on the table. And that is the key part of genuine communications and engagement. It's all about listening. Now, as Stephen Covey said, and I love this, is the biggest communication problem is we don't listen to understand, we listen to reply. And how many times have you, have I, been in a, in a, uh, in a meeting <clears throat> or even a one-to-one -one. and all we're doing is we're being quiet and waiting for a gap so we can jump in with our opinion we're not listening we're not listening to understand where the other person is coming from we're not listening to to we probably we don't even care we just want to we want our opinion out there but if we listen and then play back what they're actually saying that's active listening and that is what all change leaders need to do to really get under the skin of how to get people engaged with the change. And even better, we learn stuff as we do that. We learn what about the change needs to change. So uh, what about the strategy needs to change? And if we listen, we engage with people and they're on board now and we, we can actually deliver this change together. <clears throat> because remember, emotions trump logic every single time. There was a Portuguese neuroscientist called Professor Del Marcio who, who uh, did a piece of research on people that had damaged part of their brain, either by accident or, or at birth. And it was the part of the brain that dealt with emotions. And in fact, it was almost like switched off so that they were like Spock. They could only think logically. Emotions played a very small part uh, in their lives. And what he also found is they couldn't make decisions because we need emotions to make decisions. We are dealing with humans. We're creatures of emotion. Even in financial services, I spend a lot of my time in where we get very high IQ and sometimes not as high EQ people. Um, and they, they, we all believe we're making decisions based on logic and we're not. We're based not only logic. Logic underpins the decision, but it's emotion that really convinces us that uh, that is the, the the right decision to make we have confidence in a fund manager you know, we have we we have uh, you know commitment to a certain to a certain direction and that is about emotion and that's how we react to change this is something i put together for for henley or first did it henley i call it the change matrix it's not a particularly creative name for it but it, it plots the size of the change versus the degree of personal control and it's the x-axis where the uh, where the magic happens, the degree of personal control that we have over the change. And in every single one of those squares, we experience a roller coaster of emotion. I'm only going to be talking about the top two because that's where big change happens. The burning platform quadrant where big change is forced upon me and the quantum leap quadrant, which is big change that I have chosen. And when we're in either of those quadrants, we undergo a roller coaster of emotion. Let me talk to you about the burning platform quadrant. I want you to wear two hats here. I want you to wear a personal hat of big change that you've gone through and a leader's hat of how you can help your people navigate this change curve. 
so many of you will have seen a version of this before. Um, and therefore, by all means, you know, put some comments in the chat of what you feel you've when you've used this or experienced this before. What's your big uh, outputs or nuggets or, or, or takeaway? It is a modified version of a, a curve that, that Kubler-Ross, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a psychiatrist from back in the 1970s. She was Swiss back then, I think moved to the States. She wrote a book called On Death and Dying, and she this was her grief curve. And it was what she found is that the, the emotional roller coaster that her patients went on were predictable and uniform and also matched by their loved ones. Now, this is a version that, that is, is more relevant to, uh, uh, to the world of, of, of corporate change, but it's still highly relevant. When big change is done to us, and you can think personal, like divorce or uh, um, you know, a death of a loved one, obviously, or, or, or maybe a big change uh, at work, uh, a change of role that you don't see as positive, or maybe even being made redundant. The first thing that we experience as humans when big change is done to us is shock. After that comes denial. This can't possibly be happening. When the when the leaders wake up to themselves, uh, that they, they'll and, and, and they, they'll change. They'll change it. They'll go back to the old structure. When they don't, we get angry, and that anger comes in many many forms. But it masks several fears, and those fears could be a fear of the obviously a fear of the future, a fear of financial, a fear of loss of status. You know, a fear of being blamed for not changing earlier. There's so many different fears that we talk about in the power to change. And then we slide down into what I lovingly call the trough of depression. Um, sometimes that can be big D depression, but other times it can just simply be listlessness and a feeling of I'm not in control here and completely out of control. Let's just call it the trough. That is normal. I've been in the trough before several times in my long list of careers, and I'm sure most of you have as well. All of your people will be in the trough when you instigate big change. Um, that they weren't expecting. Eventually, our heads can understand that this change is, is happening uh, and maybe there's some opportunity here. Our hearts then will accept the change and accept that there are opportunities and we can actually move on. But we don't move on to Nirvana or sunny uplands. What we move on is to another change curve down the track because this change curve is always with us. Whenever big change happens to us, we will go through the change. So the biggest message here is twofold, actually. One is accept the curve. And the, and the second one is help people through it. So when your people are getting angry because when big change happens, they're not angry at you. They're, it's a normal human reaction to big change that's done to us. And the trough is where victims dwell. You really need, we really need to help people and help ourselves when we find ourselves out, uh, getting in the trough to help ourselves to get out of it. We all know people who have ended up uh, dwelling in the trough for so long that the victimhood becomes their persona. They end up becoming victims and it becomes their, their, their they own it. They, are, they become victims um, for life, some people. What we need to do is help them to get out of the trough. And while we can ride to their rescue and put our arms around them and give them a cup of tea and say, this isn't fair, you this you didn't deserve this, I know you didn't deserve this, and they're being really nasty, whoever's persecuting you, uh, what we then need to do is to help them to say or ask the question, so what are you going to do about it? And that's a lot easier said than done, but it's the only way at the right time that we can help ourselves and help others to get out of that trough. But there's another change curve that no one tells you about. This is, happens when big change is instigated by ourselves. Let's say we've gone for a new job and we get it. We start with excitement. Another example is having a baby as well or getting married. We start with excitement and then we go, oh, my gosh, what have I done? And then fear is like, what have I done? Maybe I'm going to be rubbish at this new job. I mean, this, this is How am I going to cope with a new baby? It doesn't come with an instruction book at all. And then there's buyer's remorse or seller's remorse. Oh, my gosh, you know, what have I done? And it's our own little form of trough. When I was going through this with, uh, with one of my insurance clients, the CEO who had been there about 12 months, she started to grin. And in front of all of her, uh, her top team, she stood up and said, everyone, I'd just like you to know I finally made it through to genuine belief. 
but that was only last week. And everyone was shocked, A, at her honesty, which was wonderful, and her vulnerability. Suddenly, she had a really tight team after this. But also the fact that everyone goes through this own version of the curve when big when they instigate big change. So when you promote someone, support them. Give them the support they need to succeed. And that's another secret to success. Set your people up to succeed. What they need to succeed is self-awareness, self-belief. They need clarity from you. They need development and they need support. But you know what? So do you. So set yourself up to succeed. <clears throat> and what is it that you need to succeed? At a generic level, you need the same thing. Self-awareness, self-belief, clarity, development, support. What do you need to succeed in whatever it is you're about to set out to do? And set yourself up to succeed and set your people up to succeed. So we talked about we've talked about um, why people or sorry, how we react to change. Now let's talk about when people react to change. This is a wonderful model that I highly recommend. It's from a uh, neuroscientist called David Rock out of Brisbane. And probably about 15 years ago, I think he came up with this. He calls it the scarf model for obvious reasons. And the beauty of it is this, that when change happens, if someone perceives a loss of status, of personal status, and it's perceives, they'll, they'll be against the change. If they see a positive uh, uh, growth in status or improvement status, they'll be for the change. Same thing with certainty, same thing with autonomy, same thing with their relationships, and same thing with fairness, if I think I've been treated fairly or unfairly. So what I highly recommend is if you find someone that is reticent to a change, that you can, you know, they put their change barriers up. Think about what they could possibly be uh, afraid of. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. We all have fears, as we saw on the curves, but also run through this and say, do they perceive a loss of status? They might. OK, then what can I do to help them to uh, to improve this? Do they perceive a loss of certainty? Am I taking autonomy away from them? And then the other way is how to get people on board is big up their status, make make this, make the plan certain, <clears throat> give them some autonomy over, over certain bits and pieces, make sure the relationships are still, in other words, give them support and make sure everyone is being treated fairly. Another secret to success here um, uh, is to remove the ego and the politics. Every single one of us have been on a big uh, a big change project like an IT project, whereas it ends up like a locomotive racing down the track. And it's politically impossible to jump out in front of, of that train and say, stop, what, why are we headed in this direction? Are the, are the outcomes still valid? And, and should we just pause and actually and take the ego, take the politi politics out of this and say, are we still headed in the right direction or have things changed, has, has circumstances changed that we should change direction? That is so hard to do. And as leaders of change, you must, must do it. And the other thing is to avoid complacency, of course. I used to say the complacency was the uh, disease that only infects the successful, but actually it affects lots of organisations who have been doing the similar thing for a long time. And it's really, really hard to realize that your competitor has made a step change and you need to be following suit. So be careful and be beware of complacency. And probably the biggest thing, and we're getting close to the end of the top 10, is create a change-ready culture. Because if your people aren't ready, willing and able to embrace change, nothing's going to happen. They need to understand the change curves. They need to they need to be able to to cope with their fears. They need to voice their concerns all in a very safe environment. Did you know that that Google did a uh, a piece of research of their own teams and found the highest performing teams in Google were the ones that felt that they were psychologically safe. In other words, it was safe to try something to fail. Fail. It's a horrible term. Um, in fact, Ritz Carlton don't even use it. They're, they're not allowed to use the word fail. You have to use the word glitch. So they tried something, it didn't succeed, they learn from it and move on. Whereas a psychologically unsafe team is one where you fail and everyone remembers it and you'll learn nothing and everyone hunkers down. What are you creating? What sort of culture are you creating in your team, in your department, in your business? 
Are your people encouraged to question the status quo and are they open to new ways of working and looking to improve the way that they work as well? Are they encouraged to learn from glitches, as Ritz Carlton would have said? And the last two lines here is, is their behavior aligned to deliver the strategy you all need to deliver? And more importantly, is yours. Because <clears throat> we all need to be able to accept uncertainty. And that's what embracing change is. And leading change is all about helping people to accept that uncertainty. And I'm going to give you a couple of, of tips that I use in my my workshops and that we, we talk about this in great detail and people get up with post-it notes. We all know, or we probably know the um, uh, this particular um, uh, poem, and I've even forgot the name, oh, the Serenity uh, the, uh, the serenity Prayer, that's it, um, from Reinhold Niebuhr. It's grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There's in the middle here is the stuff we can control. It's often not that big an area. But there's certain things we can influence and there's certain things we can only observe. Now, what I do in the workshops that really works well, and I urge you to take this and use it in your teams, we put up three flip charts. And at the heading of one, we say, what are the things we cannot change? And on the second one, we say, what are the things you can change on your own? And then what are the things you can actually, we can all change together. It's great to do this in teams. What it does is it takes the energy away from wasting time on the stuff we can't control and the stuff we can't change. One of my clients, um, uh, one of the things that, that they cannot change was their HR system. And uh, to be perfectly honest, they, they were re replacing so many HR people with a system that frankly didn't work. Uh, you can't replace people with a system, uh, in particularly in HR. It's madness. So I won't tell you who it was because you're going short this talk. But but this is what was happening. And every single meeting started with complaints about the system and this is wrong and what can we do about it and this is wrong. So much so that I took the first post-it note and said, your silly HR system, and that's literally what I wrote on the post-it note, uh, put that on the first flip chart and said, that's the first thing we can't change. Now, go. And everyone got up and put their own post-it notes. Some were personal, some were as a team, um, and, and some was, was company-wide. But we had three flip charts full of post-it notes of the stuff we can't change, the stuff we could change on our own, and those things we can actually change together. And what you do with those lists is you ignore the things you can't change. You stop, not ignore, but you stop pouring your energies in there. Someone said you simply screw it up in the ball and throw it away. No, it's always good to remind, you, remind yourself is going, you know what? We can't change that. So why don't we focus on these two? And suddenly we had two wonderful to-do lists. Those things we can change on our own and those things that together, if we work together, we can change as well. Scott, you've got a really good question. Psychological safety, the same thing as mutual trust. I think they're very closely related. Um, the short answer would be yes, as long as trust, I think psychological safety might be one step further in that mutual trust can be proven if someone makes a mistake, owns up to it, and then uh, works and the group works out what we're gonna do to, uh, uh, to overcome that and then moves on. So it's not trust to never make a mistake, it's trust to learn from glitches uh, and to own up when when you've made uh, a mistake. So they're related, but I think psychological safety is is probably one step further on. But I'd love to know everyone else's views as well. Put that in the in the chat. So accepting reality is really important. So they're the essential ingredients of su a successful change. The, the the chapters eleven to to twenty of the of the change catalyst. To be perfectly honest, with a couple of others thrown in for good measure. I also recommend you all be a catalyst for change, and that is focus on the outcomes, get someone to focus on the process, and together you can deliver some amazing things if you realize that all change is personal, all change is emotional, <clears throat> and change needs to be done together uh, as, a, as a team. Because this all boils down to leadership. It's not about change management. To me, change management is people walking around with clipboards. That process is really important, and I need change managers whenever I'm, I'm looking after a big change initiative. But change leadership is the thing that will make or break the change initiative 
the business strategy, the merger, the acquisition. I would like you to write down what do you think the most common traits of extraordinary leaders of change are? And here's 14 that have come out of my workshops. If this we were running this as a, as a workshop, we would actually break into groups if we had the time here. We'd break into groups and I'd ask you, what, what, how does a poor leader make you feel? And some of the answers we've got back. And you think of it. You think of poor leaders and how do they make you feel? They make you feel small. They make you feel irrelevant. They make you feel like you don't want to come into work anymore. They, they make you doubt yourself. And what does an extraordinary leader do? And extraordinary leaders are extraordinary leaders of change. And here's the top 14 that have come out of three, four years of, uh, of doing these workshops. Extraordinary leaders deliver results. It's really strange, but people don't seem to mention that. Extraordinary leaders care. Extraordinary leaders are trusted. They possess integrity. <clears throat> I'm sure there's there's a there's a, an XPM uh, in my mind when I'm when I'm talking about a lack of integrity. But the extraordinary leaders possess integrity. They're clear about what they're trying to achieve. They're empathetic. They empower people, and I love this. This is really crucial. They create more leaders, not more followers. And that's a boldness, as Jacinda Ardern said, that there's a there's a strength in humility. And, and that's what extraordinary leaders are as well. Number nine is something that please take this away and write this down on, as, on your nugget paper. They embrace stewardship. They create a legacy. And I'd like you to ask yourself, what is your legacy? What are you going to leave behind? Because stewardship is about leaving your team in a better state than when you found it. Very few companies embed this into their culture. I highly recommend you embed it into yours. Leaving your team in a better state than when you found it. Leaving your department in a better state than when you found it. Leaving your business in a better state than when you found it. And, and uh, extraordinary leaders are humble enough to do that. They enable people to shine. They, they, they empower them. They, they create more leaders because they want their legacy to be a better organization, better people, and, and creating leaders of leaders below them. <clears throat> They change their minds, they share their credit, they're authentic, and they build extraordinary leadership teams because leadership today is a team sport. It's not just a solo pursuit. Emotionally, and all of that adds up to emotionally intelligent leadership. The one thing you'll do when you have a look at this video back again will be, where are you on this checkerboard of leadership? This comes from our Leading with Influence our program that, that, that we run. Are you an extraordinary leader or en route to be extraordinary leader? Or are you a chaos creator most of the time? Or maybe you're on the cusp. But extraordinary leaders deliver results through their people. And that's what extraordinary leaders are all about. So it's all about change. And I always end with this slide. It's not the strongest of the species that survived, my friends, nor the most intelligent. Thank goodness for that but it's the ones that are most responsive to change. And that goes for people, that goes for leaders, and it goes for organizations as well. Thank you so much. That's, that's the end of, the, uh, of, of a run through of what can be uh, a six day course, a half day course, a two hour course, um, or as you said, a 45 minute uh, discussion. I'd love uh, to have your chats. By all means, put your... Uh, this could be chaos, but let's do it anyway. Uh, put your um, um, uh, microphones on, put your cameras on. Uh, what questions have you got? And I'd like to share what stood out from you uh, today. I'm more than happy to make the slides available, Paula. I can uh, have that uh, on the download section of my, of my website. Um, so I can put that on later today. It'll be in PDF form. No problem with that uh, whatsoever. So sharing some of your nuggets or a question that you may have over something that I said, there's so much in what I what I raised through, but something that I said that you might agree with, you want to underline, or you actually might know, Campbell, I, I disagree with that. What I've found in successful change is X. Paul, clarity seems to be particularly important. I do agree. Who'd like to ask a question? I've got a question for you, Lisa, is how different is this than it was three years ago? <laughs> 
Uh, can I can I have a go? Sure, it's okay, then. Uh, thank you so much for the talk, first of all. It was really enlightening and really very helpful. Um, my question is, I mean, I have an idea of the response in my head, but it's good to get insight on it. Yes. Uh, so one of my employers that I used to work for felt that big scale change could only be brought about by changes in employees. So mass scale redundancies, big organizational restructures, and that from yeah. my perspective caused more chaos than what needed to happen. I think um, there'll be a lot of nodding heads behind the camera. <laughs> and talk the yeah. So it's often felt that you just need to wipe it off and have a clean slate. Uh, <laughs> what's your uh, perspective, <laughs> I guess, is a big well, question. Well, there, there's a couple of things there. And um, and Joseph, we'll get back to your point in a second. If I don't, then put your camera on and, and, and ask it. Um, yeah, there's a couple of points there. Any big change, I saw this a lot at Anderson Consulting in that they would be going in with the big system and process change and they didn't really, they thought change was logical and they thought that it could be done by spreadsheets and done by all chance. Uh, and it was really to tick the box of what, what's the employment law say we have to do rather than actually go out with, here's the outcome we want to achieve now. Can, can we really fully understand what the implications or the consequences of the change and actually engage people in, in doing that? Most changes, if they only do with process and they only treat people like human resources, are not going to deliver the outcomes they set out to achieve. Now, unless the outcome is we don't care what sort of culture or productivity we have, all we want is 10% fewer people, frankly, um, and we've all been in organisations that have taken that approach. And weirdly, they've ended up with a culture um, that is that is rubbish. It's full of people that are uh, worried that they're going to be next or no, or, or or guilty that they haven't left. Um, and uh, and the productivity goes through the floor and the future. It's really hard to come back from that. So I've, I've half answered your question with how it should be done. Um, and it's not it's, it's treating it, it's actually listening it's it's understanding what the implications and consequences of the change are that takes a long time though it takes effort um uh so hopefully uh we have the time to do that if not we simply have to mop up afterwards knowing all of the mistakes we've made and that's the next best thing <clears throat> paul i'll get to yours in a second there was there was one before um uh, yeah, Joseph, how do you convince your boss 80% is good, not 20% bad? It depends on the change you're thinking about, Joseph. You've got something in mind that you, that you want to want to share? Uh, not really, just in general. Okay. Um, it's let, let me give an example on organization uh, design. Any organization design that doesn't say, here are the options we have for the structure, and here are the pros and cons of each structure, is, is, um, is going to fail. Uh, and the reason is that there is no such thing as a perfect structure. There's no such thing as a perfect change. So in order to lay out that there are pros and cons of each of the options, we've chosen option two in full knowledge, in full agreement with everyone, that these are the cons. Now, how do we get around mitigating what those, those cons are? Um, that's one example. The other is just is, is constant communication uh, and listening and prioritization. If your boss is clear on what the priorities are and that the 80% of the change hits those priorities, and then the 20% will be, okay, no change is perfect. What can we do to mitigate those? And you'll be focusing in the right way, knowing that 80% that is high priorities in the bag. <clears throat> Would be my two cents worth. Um, we'll play, friends. Now, Paula, they acute. Hang on, I've just got the back end of that. Paula, this is really good. I took over a new team and management was requesting I make some changes. And new ways of working, even though it's good for the team and the operation of the trust went horribly wrong. What are your thoughts on, uh, on implementation of these projects? Accuse me of bullying and starting an, an investigation. Gosh, I think that's that sounds like a one-to-one -one session to work to work out what what's uh, what's going on there. Um, if I can control my thing, uh, took over team management. 
Paul, would you like to just come on and say, I can't actually, for some reason, my mouse is not allowing me to, to, ah, no, here I can see it properly. I'll make some changes in new ways of working, even though it was good for the team. Uh, the question would be is, how did you engage with the team? How do you engage with, engage with all the key stakeholders? One of the things we do in the big change management or change, change leadership, sorry, that was funny, slip of the tongue, um, workshops is we go through the stakeholder assessment and stakeholder engagement framework. So to work out who is critical to to for the success of this project and whether they are saboteurs or where they sit or whether they're uh, advocates and where they sit and who's really influential and who's not. Uh, I think that would be uh, extremely helpful. Um, but um, hey, Fee, lovely to see you. Um, but I, I think that would have been a really helpful exercise to uh, to go through. It still would be now to sit back and go, OK, let's do a post analysis. What went wrong? Why? Why is this being accused of bullying? What's going on? So I would um, I would sit down and ask some questions and humbly go, tell me that, that, what what's what 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 do you think went wrong with this? Uh, what is it? Let's clarify what we're trying to achieve and get it back on the let's focus on the outcomes part of that. <clears throat> what policy related change, especially something with a very wide scope? Sorry, Paul. Um, here's one. How have we helped leaders to manage their often unrealistic approach and how quickly change will be delivered? How much can current change organizations cope with? That is a brilliant. A brilliant question and a brilliant point. Um, it's working with senior leadership teams that 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 is the most challenging, but also it's critical to be able to 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 help them to understand that people can only they, they get saturated with change. We can't be operating on 120% change all the time. We we simply have to go through those those curves and we have to give people time. So it's actually helping them to realize that the change curve is a real thing and that they're forcing people through those curves, to be perfectly honest, um, it would be a really good uh, step in the right direction. Um, and possibly putting them through a uh, leading with influence or emotionally intelligent leadership uh, program so that they uh, really understand that, that leadership is not about spreadsheets and setting impossible deadlines. Um, it, it's about engaging people to deliver. The, uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, engaging them to deliver the um, change or the strategy uh, that they needed, that is needed. So, Bella, what was that you're saying? Um, we're driving change across countries in APEC meetings, meetings, and further meetings. They need to accept the change. Yes, it's actually listing in those meetings. Um, tell me about those meetings across APEC. Yeah, we 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 are uh, a lot of countries with a lot of languages, a lot of cultures. So uh, we wanted to operate in a globally consistent process um, from the client and fee ourselves in CBRD. And we was trying to teach them, train them, and it went on for almost six, eight months. Uh, it's great to know that it is at least more emotional than you know logical. So. Uh, maybe I, I may have to work with that perspective that they have to accept the change. You know? They have to compare with the present systems maybe and what yeah. could be achieved. And it's it's in order to, you they can do that logically, but they need to do that emotionally, as you said. So it's actually um, helping them to realize that everyone has puts up barriers to change, that everyone has emotional barriers to change. And for to help them to realize, even if they don't want to say it out loud, what their barrier to change actually is, and to help them to get on board or to, to overcome their own barrier to change. But as Absolutely. the change leader, it's very much to listen to, what do you think, get them on board to say, what do you think are the obstacles and challenges to achieving the outcomes that we need to achieve? Firstly, agree the outcomes, like this is what we need to achieve. Do you agree that would be a good thing? Yes, right, help me to work out how. And part of that, how is you tell me what are the barriers, what are the key challenges? Because when we did that back at that other organization, the, the high level barriers, they just evaporated and everyone got quite excited because they've been listened to. It's yep. really important. Um, thank you. Uh, Great. Really important point. So everyone, thank you so much. What I just want to say at the, the last bit is please to find out more, get in contact, go to the website, 
There are so many videos. There are me drawing the change curve. Uh, there's uh, there's the Hungarian launch of the second book. It's in English. That's fine. Um, there's there's uh, several uh, the webinars and and speeches um, from all around the world that have been. Uh, it's been emotional to see at least. Um, uh, to, uh, to to be able to look through. Uh, there's lots of papers you can download as well. If you want to do organization design, there's a really good uh, guide to that, good guide to strategy, and of course, the whole leading change and delivering change uh, programs. Really interesting one on extraordinary leadership that I think you would really get a lot out of as well. Please sign up for the newsletter. Go to the newsletter slash blog part of the page and subscribe. Uh, and of course, have a check out the uh, uh, the programs and workshops. But thank you so much for uh, for coming along today. It has been, I've really enjoyed it. All of these, the slides will be available from the website as will the video uh, in due course, hopefully just the next, in the next couple of days. Good luck everyone. And I hope your changes are successful. Thank you for joining. Thank you.